Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 210th video cast and podcast for the week ending October 26, 2023. We're no longer going to differentiate uh, since we started the podcast after the video cast and have two separate numbers. We're just going to accelerate the podcast number to match the video cast moving forward. So, episode 210. I guess the theme of this week is the beatings will continue until morale improves. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is morale should be improving because when you look at the market, even today, um, uh, it's amazing. The Magnificent Seven, outside of Magnificent Seven and energy, most of the market's green. Uh, uh, including uh, obviously Cooper Standard, which is finally a break after uh, relentless beatings with this strike. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Even Baba's up, and Biotech's up. My goodness, I mean, uh, I better not get too used to this. But nonetheless, uh, this uh, we'll start it out with the family stuff. Um, the girls played a Brooklyn team for water polo this weekend and went in Rome. Uh, so we went to the best restaurant in Brooklyn, which is Peter Luger, to celebrate. They had three goals between them. Uh, I think the team won 15 to 6 or something like that. Uh, so that was just a great experience. I haven't been there in ages. Uh, so that was the girls there. That was Caitlin and I. There's the uh, T-bone steaks there. They love that. And then, of course, the classic dessert with the homemade whipped cream. And if you... Uh, live in New York, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, most of us don't make it out to Brooklyn too often, but uh, it was nice to see that. Also want to thank, uh, oh, by the way, last week uh, when I was talking about Annabelle, not only did she get cuts, by the way, she is now, I thought she was tied, but my wife uh, clarified for me, uh, Caitlin, uh, she is now number one in the country for 50 back, 100 back, and 200 back. So kudos for all less for the results, but more for all the hard work that both of them put in. Uh, that's the name of the game and uh, very, very excited for them. Um, okay, Reuters. I uh, want to thank Shaj, Shajwat Kahan for including me in his article on Reuters today. Uh, this was interesting. Uh, my, my basic thing was jobless came, claims came in worse than expected, which gives the Fed some level of cover to stay put and not do any more in November or hopefully in December. And then you have PC, uh, PC prices, which came in lower than expected, which adds to the narrative. So the Fed looks at jobs and inflation as to whether they're going to tighten even more. So in the case of GDP, good news is actually good news as it's a Goldilocks morning of economic data. So it was kind of the best of both worlds. The economy is accelerating, uh, but inflation and jobs uh, markets are cooling. And uh, and that's, uh, that's a good setup as it relates to the Fed. And as a matter of fact, the odds of a hike in um, the odds of a hike in November are basically zero, and the odds of a hike in December dropped to uh, I think it was twenty. Let's see here, twenty four point two percent. And that is down from 29% just a day ago. And you're seeing it in yields today. Everyone's so pessimistic. I keep looking at the 10 year yield down to 484. Uh, and this is exciting because uh, for those of you who have been listening, I've been waiting for yields to peak for weeks and weeks. And finally, it looks like they did. And then we got that kind of check back, which, you know, had me white knuckling again. And now it looks like the trend is moving in our favor. And it's reflected in all of our portfolio companies today, thank God, which is exciting to see and might be right in time for the year end rally. Uh, uh, this is the money show. They just put this up. I'll be speaking on the 14th remotely from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm going to be discussing what we believe are going to be outperformers in 2024. So you can register for free. It will be virtual money show. Uh, it's for accredited investors only. Um, email address there and you sign up there. I'll put the link in the um, show notes in Yahoo. And 
also on hedgefundtips.com, so you can take advantage of that. Quote of the week, David Tepper, we actually have two. Uh, David Tepper, we keep our cool when others don't. The point is markets adapt, people adapt. Don't listen to all the crap out there, David Tepper. Uh, <laughs> so that's that. And then this is what I'm talking about as it relates to um, most of the market being up outside of the Magnificent Seven. So just take a look. Banks are having a great day. That's exciting. Small caps are positive on the day. That's big. We've been waiting for that. Uh, equal weighted index is up uh, nicely on the day. We've been waiting for that. As a matter of fact, the bank index is up 3.15%. That's unbelievable uh, with the NASDAQ down over 1%. This is pretty exciting. I think what you're seeing is a lot of the uh, people that were overweight Magnificent Seven are getting margin calls. So it'd be interesting to see how we close into the end of the day. I'm recording this at 2.51 p.m. Uh, and margin calls um, usually wrap up between 2.30 and 3 is my understanding. So I think... Um, I think it would be uh, interesting to see, does tech get a bit, I'm just looking at the tape as, a, as I'm recording this so I can have a sense of, but the 10 year yield is the most important thing, 484, that's exciting. So look at this, Magnificent 7 down, banks up huge, even PayPal is up, you know, God bless, we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit about that on today's call. Uh, energy's down, great, no problem. Uh, biotech's up. Uh, real estate REITs are getting bid nicely, uh, interest rate sensitive, utility staples, which we talked to get about last week. So, um, so the world is uh, looking good. Bill Miller, when asked about what I worry about in the market, the answer is usually nothing because everyone else in the market seems to spend an inordinate amount of time worrying. Um, I agree with Bill. And Bill obviously does bottom-up work like we do and buys individual companies and, and that generate free cash. Uh, I probably worry more than Bill in terms of paying attention to everything all the time just to have a sense of where everything's going. But I think when we go through some of the data points and we sit back and have a reasoned view of where we are relative to the emotional view of the talking heads that you see every day, I think you're going to find that there's more opportunity than there is difficulty. You know, pessimists look for the uh, opportunity and the difficulty. I'm sorry, uh, pessimists look for the difficulty and the opportunity. Optimists look for the opportunity and the difficulty. And our theme is always looking for the opportunity and the difficulty, finding the pony in the pile, uh, as we covered last week. Here is TLT. So you had that outside day, which we're going to cover uh, last uh, on Monday. Uh, ran up. Then yesterday we had the fake out, which had everyone on end. We didn't make new lows, thank God. And now we're headed back up. Uh, this this could be a regime change in which what we've talked about, when it starts to work, everything's going to work. And uh, and we're excited about that. Amazon stock could climb more than 35%. What Bush says, well, <laughs> uh, we'll see. That was uh, six days ago. It might be climbing 30% from much lower base. But they're going to report tonight. Uh, they're looking for a bump in AWS. I think, uh, you know, Google's earnings were off the charts, top and bottom line, huge beats. Their cloud decelerated, but Microsoft's Azure accelerated. So I think it's the biggest get the bigger getting bigger. And I think the same. And so so Amazon should be a beneficiary. And, um, and I think the same is going to hold true in China. Uh, with uh, Alibaba being the largest largest cloud provider, the bigger going to get bigger. Uh, Ozempic won't because the amount of cost that goes into the compute power to do the large language models is significant, and um, and the economies of scale are going to be a big deal. Ozempic won't change the world or your flight. Here's why. So this was a rational author, of course, from Barron's, the best financial publication in the business. Teresa Rivas. Um, basically talking about, uh, you know, most people not getting covered and then the ones whether they can stay on it, et cetera, et cetera. So you can check that one out uh, when you have time. And then RBC put out a note, Ozempic fear in food and drink stocks has gone overboard. So these guys are uh, coming on after I said that on uh, Charles Payne. I don't know if they were all watching me on Charles Payne or not, but uh, but nonetheless, there are a few rational thinkers out there. Uh, and here, consumer staple stocks, now their cheapest since 2020 lows, pandemic lows, which uh, uh, is very, very 
Um, a lot of opportunity there. And medical devices fall into this. There, there are a number of them that are very interesting. Uh, UAW, the great news, UAW says it reached a deal with Ford, which means the other two will follow suit and, uh, and we'll be off to the races. And uh, Cooper Standard is uh, up eight and a half percent. It's been up as much as, I think, uh, 14% today and as low as 6%. But the key is it's moving in the right direction. Considering it's not ratified, considering the other two are not completed yet, uh, that's a nice little bounce in the right direction, which we're pretty excited about. 3M, another hated stock that's getting a break, posts a huge earnings beat following the recent legal settlements. And the big deal here, they raised guidance. Um, as for the third quarter, the results look solid. 3M generated free cash flow of $1.9 in the third quarter alone, uh, better than the $1 billion projected by Wall Street, helped by lower inventory levels. Remember, this is a recurring theme throughout our, our portfolio. Stanley Black & Decker, Generac, uh, was Intel when we got in at $25 and change. Um, uh, so Intel, uh, pretty much all of them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me just see here. Yeah, so, but here's the key. So, so Wall Street had only projected they do a billion dollars in free cash flow this quarter. They did 1.9 billion. They expect to generate 5.2 billion in free cash flow, uh, about $400 million higher than analysts are modeling. So the, the, they're working through the inventories, they're taking out costs, they're getting these things settled. It's trading at a high single digit multiple. You, you know, you never say never, but you're not, you're never gonna get another chance to buy 3M at a single digit multiple. It's just not, you know, yes, there'll be more litigation headaches that come and go, but this thing is a cash machine and now they've got it running on all cylinders. Um, that's pretty exciting to see. Um, Okay, not sure what happened to. Let's see, let me just see if it got pushed off or if it's yeah okay so it's it's after the news all right um, let's get through these things then. Okay, three M bounces off eleven year low after earnings beat by wide margin outlook raised so we got that three uh, M says business is improving boost earning, earnings guidance. Okay, economy grew at 4.9% pace last quarter, fastest since 2021. Um, so we saw that in the GDP numbers, everyone's calling for a recession and yet we're growing at the fastest. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why and what everyone's missing with their historic backward looking models and recency bias between their inverted yield curves and their lagged effect of policy. They continue to forget the elephant in the room, which is $4 trillion of excess money supply that's in the system and is going to take years to work through, which does mean inflation will run above trend, which is a good thing to bring debt to GDP down. And we're gonna talk about how that works in terms of the equation. You can't get, uh, look, <laughs> life comes down to a simple fact. And anyone that tells you otherwise uh, is, uh, you know, probably leading you in the wrong direction. It's called no pain, no gain. Whether you want to lose weight, whether you want to make money, if you want to lose weight, you know, eat healthy and exercise. If you want to make money, you got, you know, if you want outsized returns, you got to accept short-term volatility and concentration. You're not going to outperform with 30 or 50 stocks. It just doesn't happen. So uh, not over, not, not over the long time, uh, long term. Mathematically, it doesn't work. So uh, okay, Amazon reports today, Wall Street expects an AWS bounce. G e GM scales back EV plans as buyers hesitate. This, I think, is actually constructive. Um, our base case with um, Cooper Standard was uh, on the basis of ICEs looking back at 2017 production, seven, $7 a share, and we think production is actually going to exceed that because you have the millennials, you have more favorable demographics. When people move to the suburbs and start families, they buy more cars. You didn't have that in 2017. The last time you had that was 1990 and the 90s was the halcyon days for the automobile industry and that's coming back. So um, for my friend and, and client who owns a ton of auto dealers, uh, you know where you are. We'll just say on the East Coast, uh, good things are coming uh, and um, uh, in terms of volumes and everything else. And the OEMs will be offering more and more incentives. And you hear it now more and more on the radio. 
and uh, and I have a friend who who uh, owns a bunch of radio stations. They did a roll up, and every time I see him, he's like, uh, "You can ask me the same question." And I always ask him the same question: Is auto advertising picking up with incentives? And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, it's getting better. It's getting better." So, uh, all right, G, GM scales back EV. Okay, so they're going to do hybrids. And if you recall, and there was no basic major hybrid business in 2017. Uh, hybrid business, I think, is like 27 parts versus the ICEs, which are 15 parts or whatever. The point is they have a higher margin for the hybrid cars than they do for the ICEs and the highest margin for the EVs, which they had zero EVs in 2017. So the answer to your question is we could get 85% of 2017 production over the next few years, which I think we're going to get 115% because of the demographics. And on that basis, uh, still exceed the $7 a share, not to mention all the cu cuts that they uh, took out of the business uh, and everything else. So um, pretty exciting stuff. Moving along, Ant Financial. Ant Group buys land to expand headquarters as fintech firm and Alipay operator emerges from the shadow of China's tech crackdown. So... They paid $210 million for a land for new buildings. It's not the sign of a business that's going backwards. And remember, as owners of Alibaba, we own a third of Ant Financial, and that should be going public uh, within the next 12 months or sooner at this point, which is pretty exciting. It'll be happening just at the point where sentiment is turning dramatically and prices gone up and people start to get interested in China again and chase, uh, and we'll, we'll benefit from all that. Uh, China to choose fiscal muscle over big reforms to revive economies, so they're back to the future, back to what always works in China. Uh, property companies blow up, big stimulus comes out, stock market goes up. So we've had the property companies blow, you know, so funny, you know, in the midst of the war, people are like, aren't you worried about all these property companies? I, I said to them, I said, I've been in this business forever. I can't remember when China has not had a problem with property companies. I mean, even when the stock market's up, when the stock market's down, they're always having a problem. And then they always stimulate out of it. And, they, and this time is no difference. Why? Because a politician's number one job is to get reelected. And you could say, well, Xi doesn't have to get reelected. Well, then a politician's number one job is not to get overthrown and carried out in a stretcher by a revolt of 20% of 20, 20-somethings 20 that are unemployed uh, and educated and angry. So he's turning, things are turning the corner. We're seeing it in the numbers. Now we're getting, if we get a catch, if this rate move is what I think it is, and we are backing off five and going to stay off five, and then the dollar starts to weaken, all this stuff is just going to rocket all at once. And I'm very uh looking forward to that <laughs> um okay so stimulus china stimulus to make big impact xpboc official says uh beijing stages charm offensive to pave way for xi trip so apparently he's supposed to meet uh biden in san francisco uh next month so that would be exciting continued progress china plans a twice a decade financial policy conference next week. So we'll probably get more color on the stimulus that's going to be cranking out of Beijing. Uh, China sovereign wealth fund extends to buying ETFs. So like Japan has done, they will now step in and just buy their own stocks. God bless, thank you for your assistance. Uh, Xi makes an unprecedented central bank visit in a sign of focus on economy. He had to use Google Maps to get there. Apparently, he's never been there before. Uh, he's learning pretty quickly as the CSI approached uh, new lows. I guess he got in his car and said, hmm, how does this thing work? Oh, it's very simple. You ease, ease policy and you stimulate, and it stops going down. Uh, so how's that for saving you a car trip? Uh, China profits offer weary stock traders just a glimmer of hope. I love that. I want to see this pessimism all the way up. I want the negative headlines. I want to see uninvestable when Alibaba's at $150 and let it just let the skeptics just push this whole thing, climb the wall of worry all the way back to the promised land. Um, I don't want to see any exuberance. I want everyone to hate China all the way up to new highs. China sig signals zero tolerance for sharp economic slowdown with rare steps. Moves show sense of urgency amid persistent housing downturn. Uh, support package remains conservative. They're doing about uh, eight tenths of 1% of GDP. 
So, um, so, so that would be in our economy, call it 250 billion in the US economy. That's not, that's not nothing, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do the conversion for their economy, but it's, it's not nothing. If it was 250 billion in the US, that's, you know, basically uh, commensurate with the Inflation Reduction Act over here. Um, not a bad thing. Google Cloud miss overshadows upbeat earnings for Alphabet sending stock lower. So just a lot of people all crowded into it on leverage. If you remember when we covered the most crowded trades, short China was number two, long tech was number one. Uh, no change. We own um, Google at, from at 93.25 on, on balance and uh, uh, Amazon. You know, if these things trace back 10 or 20 percent, we have no reason to um, to sell them. We're comfortable. Uh, are we closing in on capitulation levels for Chinese stocks? And the answer is yes. And they show all these instances where uh member percent of members above the 200 day moving average so we do this in the us and we're going to cover that when it gets to these extreme levels you get these monster parabolic moves uh sometimes the next day sometimes after a few months but you get them china is starting to get serious about stimulus okay we covered that all right this is a very important chart this is the japanese yen and I've been paying attention to currency a lot. I've also referenced in recent weeks that either they will do uh, global coordinated central banks will either step in proactively or reactively after something breaks. And I pointed to the Bank of Japan. Uh, I think this setup looks really, really interesting here uh, at the Japanese yen. And what represents my attention to it today uh, you can see here it's making a quote unquote double bottom. OK, whatever. Uh, but the Japanese are probably going to wind up stepping in and they're going to step in buying bonds to keep yields low, which might be the main reason we're actually seeing the 10 year yield start to uh, behave itself. Um, the other thing that was in so commercials are super long. They get super long. You tend to get rebounds. They got super long here in 2007. Monster rebound same thing in 2001 2002 so the commitments of traders on the japanese yen futures contract uh, are also pointing to that the yen should rebound uh, the dollar should weaken that's all fine and dandy and then this caught my attention this famed trader known as 50 cent and those of you who've been around remember that over the years he he's made some vix bets before the vix basically broke uh, where he would bet on increasing volatility and bet on huge amounts of uh, VIX 50 cent way out of the money options. And he made, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, so now he's doing the same thing on the Japanese yen and he thinks it's going to rebound violently. And if that happens, you're going to have two things. Number one, you're going to have a mass compression in yields. That's how it helps our emerging market story. And number two, you're going to see a massive move in uh, emerging markets because, um, um, you know, it, w on a relative basis with the U.S. dollar, we'll, we'll t and we're going to talk about the U.S. dollar in a little bit. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, here's from RBC. It's just some updated stuff on. Is this the right note? No, it's the wrong note. OK, not a big deal. I uh, wanted to walk through some of the names we've talked about in recent months on the podcast and just kind of zoom out and get give everyone some perspective because it's been a little bit uh, gloomy of late, although that seems to be changing very nicely today. Um, and these things are just going through their normal, you know, you get your first bottom, then you get a huge flush shakeout, huge flush shakeout before you rebound. But these things are super duper extended. You look at advanced auto parts, uh, cash generative ability. Um, I spent about two hours with a guy who runs a local Monroe um, um, garage and it and uh so why is o'reilly so much better than uh advanced auto parts and autozone and um etc and he said they're not actually advanced auto parts is the best um if you call someone at o'reilly you get someone who worked at dairy queen or walmart that knows nothing about autos if you call someone at um advanced auto parts 
you get someone who knows the business and you get your part within an hour with whereas O'Reilly and AutoZone, you get it in, maybe you get it that day, maybe you get it the next day, maybe you never get it. And I, I was shocked because O'Reilly is such a compounder. I was like, so then why is the stock getting, why, why do people think the stock is toast um, or the business is toast? Because he's not a stock guy. He runs one of these uh, uh, branches for Monroe, which is also a public company. And he's like, well, under the last CEO, they renegotiated contracts and lost some big clients because they retraded on pre-existing deals trying to juice margins um, at the wrong time. So they have a new CEO in who ran HD Supply, which is the um, commercial distributor for Home Depot and did an incredible job with that business. So they're going to fix this all, this all, and it's going to take time and no one believes it, but then you'll rebuild an institutional share base and you'll get these abrupt rebounds. Everyone will say what happened and the thing's up 100% in a year, year and a half. Um, so that's that. The other thing, by the way, uh, people worry about balance sheets. So a lot of these are balance sheet worries because when you don't know when rates are gonna stop going up, you you can't, you think it could go to infinity. And at some level, it's just, it makes every business insolvent until you know when it's stopping. Once it stops and backs off, you can model it very hard to model any asset when your discount rate keeps changing every single week. Uh, and when it keeps changing like that, all analysis goes out the window and you see this completely irrational, emotional, structural uh, puking, like, you know, just get me out at any price unrelated to, to the business. Um, and that's where we benefit. So, um, but, you know, here's the other thing. When you buy a stock, that's down 80%, and we love to buy stocks that are down 80%, provided they're good quality, durable businesses that have worked through many other cycles and we understand the business. You don't know if the stock is gonna go down another $5. You know, here's a stock, it was at $231. You buy it at $55, it goes down to 50. That's a huge drop from 55 to 50, but it's a nothing drop in the scheme of the stock has dropped 180 points. So you missed the last five or 10 or 15, like in percentage gains in the short term until you get that reversal, like you saw in Vernado, like you saw in banks in 2020, which by the way, banks are setting up the same way, which is mind boggling, although they're now starting to take off up 3.3% as a basket today. Um, and that's, you know, that's why there, we talk about the equation, you know, no pain, no gain. You don't get doubles over a year or two without short-term volatility. We went through the same thing I remember on the podcast, uh, one of the positions we talked about publicly, and we don't talk about all of our positions publicly, only our clients know all of our positions, uh, was Wells Fargo. And I remember just waiting on that thing for like four or five months. It was grinding sideways to down, and then all of a sudden it just shot up from 25 to 55 in like four or five months. And it was just boom, overnight. Um, here's Amazon, we'll see what they do tonight. But just take a look historically when they get these huge, uh, you know, dropped over 50%. And um, it doesn't happen very often for um, Amazon. But when it does, you always get these checkbacks and they look like nothing when you zoom out. And that's how you should perceive them as nothing here and here and here. Maybe we'll get one here. Maybe we already had it. Maybe it'll be a little more pronounced before it rallies to new highs. But you have to solve it. And, and if you know the business, Alibaba, again, it's just simply done nothing since uh, early 2022. So it's been a year and a half. It's been dead money. But, you know, what these things do, whether it's this thing, you see the same type of consolidation down, then you consolidate, then you get the final fake out, then you get a parabolic move down, you consolidate. You know, it looks like nothing when you zoom out. These are 30 and 40 percent moves until you get the 200 percent ups and the 300% ups, uh, and it happens very, very quickly. So, you know, we're just getting rid of the last uh, last handful of um, uh, weak sisters, and then we'll, we'll take it to the next level. Uh, Bank of America, same thing. Feels like banks are never ending decline. The thing is barely even moved. You can buy this quality business at a discount. I love it. I love seeing it's up today. I love Brian Moynihan. It's just doing higher highs and higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, stair step up, recovering from the great financial crisis all day long, ready to make new highs and sustain them and, and onto the promised land. Uh, Baxter, same story. You get this 
huge abrupt flush out. Then you get this, oh, it's going to be okay. And then boom, flush them out one more time, just like we're getting now with GLP-1. Like, give me a break. And then boom, you work back up to new highs. Same exact thing during the, it's just over and over. Flush, scare them, go to new highs. Um, Citibank, same story, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. And we'll work up to higher highs and we'll see what it looks like at $75 plus. Um, and, um, and we'll go from there. Cooper Standard, so we get a nice bounce today, up 10%. Uh, but again, you know, it's funny, a friend said to me the other day, why didn't you just sell it at $22? Because two things, number one, I didn't want to give my clients a huge tax bill, ordinary income. But number two, we know where we're getting out before we get in. And nothing has changed uh, between the time that we got in at 550 in May of last year, uh, then today, and we got into this thing for it to work through one cycle and get back to seven to nine dollars of earnings power and then we would decide whether we were accepting of a 10 times multiple which would make a seven dollar stock which would be a trough multiple or we would wait with some portion of the stock for a 20 times multiple so we're in this for a lot more than 20 bucks and the amount of risk that we assumed last year when the when they were going through the refinancing demands much more than a five bagger or four bagger or whatever it was at um, uh, $22, a four and a half bagger, 310. We didn't get in for a 310%. We got in for a, a S ton more than that. And we're going to be patient and bide our time and work through the cycle and get the benefits of that risk. That's not to say we won't take some off on the way up, but 22 is not even getting started. I mean, if they were to give us credit for three dollars a share in earnings when it's you know maybe earning 50 cents or a buck and they give us a 12 times multiple or something and it's 35 or 40 dollars and they're giving us credit for a lot more than they're doing at the moment a year out from now maybe we'll take some off and maybe if the market's being too excited about it we'll take some off but there's going to be a portion of this that we try to hold for triple digits um it's not going to be all of it it's not going to be the majority of it but we think this thing has a lot of legs so on a blended basis, we want to be out at many, many multiples of $22, uh, or we wouldn't have assumed that risk. That said, we took the biggest risk last year, and the reason we were willing to assume that risk is because we were would be involved if we had to be in helping them get refinanced and, and getting them access to private credit if we had to be, uh, if they couldn't get it done on their own. They got it done on their own, so we didn't have to do anything. Uh, and big credit to management, but we would be involved if required, and that's where, why we we're willing to assume that risk. The other reason we were willing to assume the risk is that the CEO owned 189,000 shares, so I had a partner, and they had a history of respecting equity and not giving out options like a bunch of animals that some of these companies just completely screw their owners. Uh, and they think like owners. The board thinks like owners. Management thinks like owners. Why? Because they are owners. They own stock that they either bought or earned that weren't given at the expense of shareholders. And um, and that's what I like. Side by side with skin in the game. And uh, this thing hasn't begun. So um, you know, a little bit white knuckling there with the uh, with the with the um, strike because you don't want it to last forever. But we knew that the UAW would run out of money before the OEM, so we had pretty good uh, indication that it would end, and the colder it got, the better it got. And, uh, and we saw last week on the live call update where it was when we posted on Twitter, every other comment was, let us vote, let us vote, let us vote. So I could see the union members were, were flipping out. I mean, there's one guy that said, my wife wants to call Sean Fain directly. Uh, it wasn't like go Sean, you know, kick their butts. It was like that was like one out of 10. 10 comments were like 23 percent pay raise. Let us vote. Let us vote. This is a record deal. So Fain held out. He got another two percent. Uh, I get you. Know, I give the guy credit. I mean, this is a good deal in the sense that neither side is walking away from the table with a huge smile. No one got everything they wanted. Um, I think that the. OEMs didn't play this properly. I would have handled it a lot differently at, out of the gate. Um, but um, that's okay. I mean, it, it turned out. And that's why I don't own the OEMs. I own the suppliers. 
Uh, Disney, same thing. You know, here you check down, you roll down lower. So we could go lower before we go higher, but this is normal stuff and work back to new highs. You when <laughs> when you buy a business that is one of the greatest brands in the world for decades and decades and decades, and now you got a decent manager running it for the next four or five years to turn it around, and it's down 60%. If it goes down, you know, if you buy it at 85 and it goes to 70, it seems like a big percentage drop in the short term. But like at the end of the day. If you don't think it's going to be back at 150, 200, 250 dollars over the next three to five years, you shouldn't be in it. Like, and you just. So anyway, I, I know this stuff is easier said than done, but if you've lived through enough cycles, you understand this. So Generac, same thing. Inventories, same thing. You go down, you you flush people out again a second time. You know, lower lows. It's a good thing. But you know, when you're down from 524 to 100 bucks, or now it's 80 bucks, whatever it is. You're down 80, 85 percent. An extra 10 or 20 bucks before you find a bottom. It, it, the margin of safety is there, and the difference between people who can make big money over time and those who can't are the people who trade on leverage and want, have to watch every single tick because they're going to get a margin call because they're being re reckless, like Warren, like uh, Charlie Munger says, excess of ladies, liquor, and leverage are the three killers. Uh, mostly, it's leverage when it comes to investing. Um, if you can stay away from that and just, you know, use zero or modest so that even if a stock goes 25% against you, you don't think about it because you bought a business that's cash flow generative, that's a high quality business that you've seen how it operates through cycles, that you're not predicting the future and making a binary bet if it's going to be the next best thing, like which electronic charger is going to be the best one. I, I have no idea. I mean, maybe we'll be doing all hybrids at 100 miles per gallon and we'll, and, and and Teslas and no one else will do uh, EVs because no one really wants them. Uh, who knows? Uh, Google, same thing. Wow, what a huge drop yesterday. I can hardly see it on this chart. I mean, it's the same exact thing. You, you work your way off the lows, you check back. Maybe we're going to come back a lot more. Maybe we'll go down to one, 110 or something. I mean, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath on it. I think we've already done that. But, you know, these are normal in the process of owning a good quality business. Intel can hardly see the pullback here. There's all this noise from, I guess, uh, TSM, TSM reported yesterday or whatever. It's, you know, they're going to report. Maybe they'll pull back into the 20s. Maybe it'll be a good report. They'll shoot up to 40. You know, this thing is just beginning. And, and that's that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Small caps, we're going to talk about it today. Haven't made a gain since in five years. Uh, and now I think getting set up. KRE, look at this. This is the same exact thing you saw in the great financial crisis lows. You get your flush, you get your check back, and then you work to new highs. Or you get your rally, and then you do a major check back and work back to new highs. So you got your flush in 2020. You do this check back, flush. You know, it's just normal human psychology and it happens over and over. And at the bottom, there's all the reasons. Here it's European sovereign debt. Here it's COVID. Here it's commercial real estate, except that everyone has to go back to work now because, because if they don't, they're getting fired. So uh, 3M, you know, just doing this normal check back. But if you look at all the headlines for the last year, you know, it's like, People couldn't focus on the business and now they're starting to focus on the business now and realizing it's good. But again, you get lower lows and then you move back to new highs. But, you know, you buy it at 100, it goes to 85, people flip out. And the ones that hold on because they're not on leverage, they get out at 200 or 250 a couple years down the road. And that's how money's made over and over. PayPal, going to generate over $5 billion of free cash flow. They could buy back the entire company and take it private over the next decade just from share buybacks with the amount of cash that they're generating. And yet you can't give it away. So uh, sooner or later, people will wake up trading at a 10 times or nine times multiple. You know, it seems to be a common denominator. We buy things at a high single digit multiple uh, when no one wants it, when they're growing cash flow, people can't understand it because all these institutions got wiped out because they bought up here on leverage. Now they're all flushed. It'll take time to form a new base of shareholders. And you'll be off to the races. Does it go to 300 from 50? No, but it definitely goes to 100, 150. It probably does that over the next couple of years. Then we'll see what the business looks like. 
and um, we'll either hold it uh, if it's getting better or we'll lay it off as people are getting excited about it coming out of the hole over and over. Stanley Black & Decker, another inventory story, same type of thing, bottom, check back, start to move, check back, just keep scaring people out of their stock, knocking their margin calls as they buy up into strength because they get all excited. And then you leave them behind and then you just work up to new highs until you get all the schmucks coming in above $220 and you lay it off to them. And that's that's just how it works. TLT, same thing. We're going to talk about that. We'll look at that. That's starting to finally rebound. I keep watching that like a hawk. 80, yeah, 484 still. That's good. Uh, VF Corp. Uh, no one could, you couldn't give it away. And then some activist came in yesterday, uh, last week. The stock was up 12% in a day. So now you're seeing this uh, other bottom, but it's not even beginning, you know, and it'll fall back again after the activist excitement uh, goes away. But once rates stabilize and they're like, oh, they can refinance if they have to, it'll start to work higher. And you got, you know, $20, oh, no, an $18 stock, not a $20 stock. Okay. So, but it's down from $87. So, you know, <laughs> these type of things, that's a four bagger over the next three to five years, but no one wants it because. I think Timberland and Vans and all these iconic brands are going to be out of business. And it's just not the case. They sell off what they have to sell off. Similar story with Fornado. We went through that. Now it bounced up. But look, when it does these bounces, guess what it does? It checks back and takes all the Johnny comes lately. Why? Because the dumb people buy after the huge rallies. Then they get shaken out of margin. And once you shake all, all the weak sisters out, it takes off to its next leg to new highs. I spoke to someone who's very good friends with one of the top people uh um at vernado and um just in in joking he said you know uh steve roth will not die until the stock is back at record highs <laughs> and that's like 80 percent of the reason i bet on the stock was because of steve vernado i, I steve vernado steve roth uh, <laughs> so had tim apple you know steve roth uh if, if you couldn't kill this guy during the great financial crisis you're not killing him now and um i don't know if we'll hold it to new highs but because you know but um, uh, I, I think that's 100% true. Best properties in the best city in the world. So we won't go into that. Even biotech is up today. My goodness, with rates down, biotech's up. But look at this. You know, it does these type of things. You have these crashes. Then you have these checkbacks. Even here, uh, this, and then you even flush to new lows. I mean, that could mean $60 before you go back up to 150 I hope not, but it could be. Uh, and but it's going to work higher and you're seeing there was another deal done bio bio the large pharma has so much cash and no growth they are going to buy the hell out of these things and as that starts happening xbi is going to double from here and it's just a question of what's the irr and sucking it up as we have for the last year and a half watching dead money until it comes all at once and that's kind of the summary there. I probably spent too much time on that, but I get pretty excited about these things. All right, moving on. Here's Ryan Dietrich uh, talking about um, late October historically when things tend to turn around, looking at previous years that were up 10% at the end of June, shows indigestion the past few months is normal, but things turn here and it actually shows an average of up 24.9% on average. So that would be a monster, like 14% uh, run into year end. I'm not counting on that, but it would not shock me if we saw a big rally up to 4,600 or even 4,800 because people will be so caught by surprise based on where sentiment is. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, Bernstein was out this morning for 29% of the S&P 500 companies that have reported third quarter results for so far, earnings are up plus 11%. Ladies and gentlemen, if you remember, I was on Charles Payne. And by the way, I was supposed to be on today. I want to thank Kayla, Aristivo, and Nick Palazzo for thinking of me. It didn't work out, so we're going to reschedule. But um, uh, if you remember, I was on saying everyone, you know, consensus is ne uh, negative 40 basis points. It's already plus 40 basis points. It's probably going to come in in plus three. Right now, it's plus 11, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now, if you back out the Magnificent Seven, which are the ones selling off, by the way, which is just mind boggling, uh, the index growth would drop to negative 8.6. But, um, you know, they are the, the heaviest weights. So plus 11 in aggregate, it's, it's kind of funny. The ones that are contributing all the benefits, like if you look at Google, 
their top and bottom line was off the charts. And you're going to see that reflected tomorrow when the uh, new uh, 2025 estimates are out. I think you're going to see it's, it moves up to 249 or 248 or maybe 250 for next year, despite the fact that this one, you know, it's funny. I was saying to the Reuters reporter this morning, um, I said, you know, people are losing sleep over Alphabet's cloud business being a little slow. But their cloud business is so small as a percentage of their business. Alphabet's cloud business is to Alphabet what Microsoft's search business is to Microsoft. It's like, it, this is silly season. It's like saying like if, if Bing uh, revenues decelerated 1% year on year, would Microsoft be down 15%? I mean, it's, it's silly season is, is exactly what it is. And meanwhile, this little nothing business in Google, which is their Google Cloud, which is growing, by the way, but didn't meet expectations. Um, you know, but their search business and their ad business was off the charts. So anyway, leaving that aside, the point is earnings are way up. We'll see how it evolves. My guess is it's going to be plus three all in by the time at end of earnings season. As I said at the beginning, when everyone is expecting negative, um, but we'll go from there. All right onward and upward doom and gloom stock market and sentiment results um it was hard to write this last night it was real doom and gloom there were no silver linings no resolves uh, I, I guess we did get the headline about the strike so that was a good thing but leaving that leaving that aside well i was started writing it way before then by the way so that was the good news at the end that's why i tacked it on at the end but all right this week wall street journal published an article entitled another black monday may be around the corner a friend of mine sent this to me yesterday fortunately they wrote it on sunday the 22nd so of this week now, if you remember what was going on this weekend, everyone was worried about this ground war in Gaza and all that stuff. Big tragedy, bad news, no question about it. But um, as it relates to a small regional conflict, which yes, it could accelerate, I understand that, anything could accelerate. But the point is that you couldn't be more pessimistic over the weekend, so they're calling for a Black Monday. It didn't take place the next day. Unlike Paul Tudor Jones, who called it the Black Monday on Friday, October 16th in 1987, before it actually occurred on Monday, October 19th, 1987, these two academics lack the market understanding for a repeat. They're running out of October Mondays. So good luck. They got one more left. We'll see. Here's what the nervous Nellies are focused on in this article. Number one is M2 money supply contraction. You heard this all Everyone's saying it, okay? So actually, if you look back, and this is a analog we've been following, the last time it got this low was 1995. But what the pessimists will tell you who look for the difficulty and the opportunity is that, and they call themselves realists. We're realists, except they're bearish all the time and the market goes up 70% of the time. So it's very hard to do that. And most of them aren't around for the 30% of the time that the market's actually negative and that they don't have the capital left and then um they don't bet big enough because they've been beat up so much by the time it hits 70. anyway the point is that what they'll say is this is the biggest contraction since the great depression and the problem is what's not accounted for and then they take these 1987 charts and overlay them and it's the most ridiculous stuff because uh you can lay overlay any of this stuff. I mean, I can show you three bullish charts to three bearish charts. It doesn't really matter. The point, they point to the fact M2's money supply is contracted on a year-on-year -year basis and we're in, quote, real danger. Unfortunately, this is the intellectual equivalent of focusing exclusively on the li liabilities in a balance sheet and not the assets. They go on to say, because of the sustained decline in the money supply, the economy is in real danger. So far, only the remaining excess money the Fed created between 2020 and 2021, the cumulative excess savings from the COVID handouts, has been keeping businesses and hiring and customers spending. The effects of the excess money are still giving the economy a lift, but that extra fuel is almost exhausted. When it dries up, the economy will run on fumes. What they fail to acknowledge is there are four trillion dollars of excess quote-unquote fumes from an unprecedented increase in money supply 
due to an unprecedented shutdown in global economy from 2020 to 2021. I drew the trend line so you can see just how aberrationally above trend we are. So here's the short term from the last eight years, uh, nine years, four trillion, and then you look at it in the long term. Okay, it compounds modestly, 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 and this is just off the charts. In other words, money supply will have to contract for multiple years just to come back to the long term uptrend, not pre pandemic, just back to the long term uptrend. This is one of the this is one of the reasons we believe inflation should run above trend in a reasonable range of three to five percent for a few years. Like losing weight, there is an equation. The easier the loss, i.e. pills or needles, the greater the chance of impermanence or side effects. The harder the loss, healthy eating and lifestyle, the greater the chance of sustainability and improved health. We had an easy we had easy printed money for a few years. Now we are getting involuntarily taxed through inflation in arrears at the checkout counter for that benefit previously received as an economy. Every equation has an equal sign. If you want greater returns over the long term, you have to assume greater concentration and volatility in the short term. Anyone who tells you otherwise, run away. The key way to sit with equanimity when others are selling in the hole and running for the hills is to look at each business you own, not each stock, each business. Ask yourself the following question for each company. If I own this business in a private equity portfolio, is there anything that has changed about the business operations or the ability to generate cash flow over the long term that would require me to mark the value of the business down in the portfolio. If your answer was, quote, someone sent me a chart of 1987 and I'm scared, end quote, that is not the correct answer and you should find another hobby. Here's what we're focused on. The 10-year yield achieved an outside day on Monday. The two-year yield presaged this occurrence last Thursday, despite everyone's coincident views that some famous hedge fund manager caused a multi-trillion dollar movement in the treasury market. Uh, it was already occurring last Thursday, which is why we were sanguine on that call as well. Quote, an outside day is a daily price action that has a higher high and a lower low than the previous price bar. An outside day also has an open and close that both fall outside the prior open and close. When the price bars move in opposite directions, it's called an outside reversal Investopedia. So uh, we highlighted here other outside reversals and what occurred and then what happened to the S&P thereafter. You get a contraction in yields, you get an up in equities, contraction in yields, up in equities, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the two-year yield, but that one happened before the 10-year uh, namely last Thursday, and that was our signal that maybe things were starting to change. And so far, so good. No guarantees, still 484. I literally look at that thing 100 times a day. 10-year uh, yield weekly. So this is from RBC. They're showing the momentum rolling over. That's a good sign. After hitting this 161.8% Fibonacci extension on the 10-year yield, I don't know what any of that means. All I know is it looks like it's getting exhausted. 10-year uh, yield daily, it hit also the 161.8 Fibonacci extension um, and it's starting to back off. And then the TLT, he's doing some Elliott Wave nonsense, but at the end of the day, you see capitulation selling on high volume, that's usually uh, seller's exhaustion. And then these divergences, which we talked about for a few weeks, are still in place where the momentum is moving up while price is flushing out. Those are usually better signals and uh, we like that work. And then we look at the dollar bounce running out of steam. You can see it backing off at the 50% re retracement as he points out here. Same thing here, uh, backing away uh, after this short-term counter trend bounce and starting to weaken again, which is good. We're also looking at high yield credit spreads. Look still okay. They are still in a downtrend. They've had a counter trend bounce. We do think that's gonna roll over as 
uh, yields stop going up, people get comfort about around the ability to refinance and people will start to hit the window. Seasonality still on point. This is from Carl Quintanilla via Goldman Sachs. There are 47 trading days left in 2023. Uh, they think that the year-end rally has been delayed but not fully canceled. The conditions are in place for both equities and bonds to rally into year-end. The setup for November is a lot cleaner. So everyone's looking past November 1st because you get the Treasury uh, amount of size they're going to have to auction and you get the Fed telling us what the market's already telling us that they're going to pause. Um, and then weekly seasonality improves as well. The, this week was the worst week, and then when we move into uh, one of the best weeks starting next week, which is good to see. This is from Yale Hirsch, um, uh, not Yale, um, Jeff, the son, uh, really good guy. And he is talking about the pre-election year aggregate seasonality uh, turns right, I guess, one day from now, right at uh, two or three days before um november which is a seasonal pattern aggregate from 1971 to 2022 that's for the nasdaq for the s p same type of thing and then you turn up um and then this is interesting from bno bmo capital markets the secular bull market has been reignited and they're looking at the secular bull markets which we've covered many times 1948 to 1968 and 1982 to 2000 and we're kind of mid-cycle in terms of that and that's when you start to get the bigger parabolic moves moving forward. So we'll see if we can come through these next few days and start to catch that fire once again. But it's the antithesis of what everyone's talking about. Cash is trash. This, you know, it's funny. Historically, some big names have said cash is trash when markets were at tops and when the markets were already up huge. Uh, I'm telling you cash is trash at the bottom. This is when you want to put money to work. And this uh, note from... Bank of America saying private client cash plus T bills as a percentage of the AUM. The last time it hit this high 15% was March of uh, 2020, which was the low pandemic lows. Uh, and then before that was the great financial crisis lows. Uh, mimics the uh, fund manager survey, which we went into detail last week. Their bull bear indicator, everything's pointing to extreme bearishness, time to buy, we agree. Uh, estimates for earnings next year are plus uh, 12%. So that's a positive thing. Uh, margins are going up, not down. Everyone was worried about margins because of input costs. Well, now those are going down. Uh, and then this is interesting from Fundstrat core CPI since 1982 averages 2.8%, not two. So this, this 2% fantasy, unless he's trying to cause deflation and devastation is actually not the solution. And if you go back since 1960, the average CPI, core CPI is 3.7%. So um, so I think they'll keep talking too, but they gotta be happy somewhere between three and four or two and a half and three and a half, and that would be good to bring down debt to GDP. Um, this is from Zillow uh, via JP Morgan. New home sales data may suggest a more benign picture for inflation. We've seen sustained decline in the gap between Zillow list price and Zillow sales price year to date, which indicates more sellers lowering prices to meet buyers bid. And we also said that that's the case with uh, rents last um, week because the CPI data is lagged from the 12 month lag of a lease. Whereas if you look at the currents are actually declining as those roll off and we'll see those reflected in future numbers as we had over the summer. Getting stretched, McClellan summation, each time you got down to these levels, you wanted to be a buyer, not a seller. I mean, this stuff is just basics, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't always work perfectly, but, you know, nine out of 10 or eight out of 10 times it does. This is a game of probabilities, not absolutes. Um, same thing with the, uh, that was the NASDAQ. This is the NYSE. Now, here's what's interesting. We have had a massive digestion of the 2020 to 2021 gains, okay? So we had this monster rally off the COVID lows, never looked back. And then, um, but now if you look at the S&P 500, most people wouldn't realize this, we've had 0% gains in the S&P for almost three years, for 31 months. And if you go to the NASDAQ, it has been just about three years of 0% gains. A lot of movement, a lot of headlines, a lot of noise, 0% returns. So 
Um, now, as a general rule, markets do not top over three years. They tend to top more abruptly, like a blow off top. Uh, markets consolidate and digest large gains over years before taking the next monster leg higher. And that's what I believe we are doing and probably nearing a completion uh, right here. And um, so that's that. And th this is just normal psychology. No one believed it all the way up. They started chasing up here. They got a little bit more and then they got completely flushed out. No one wanted to get in. We got a monster rally and then just started to suck people in in July and early August and just in time to flush them back out on margin before taking the big move higher. Uh, and this is just human psychology. We've gone through all the fundamentals behind it, but when you're in silly season, you gotta have to go through some of the silly stuff uh, just to get it down. Small caps, they've not only not made any new gains for three years, they've not only, they've made no new gains for five years. They are due in our view. And that's what you're seeing today, which may be a one-off, but it may be the beginning of a regime change. Emerging markets continue to be ignored just as signals point up. So these are simple signals. We've covered all the fundamental reasons. Let's just go through the mechanical reasons. Here's RSI and MACD crossovers uh, line up. You get 131% rally in a couple years. Uh, RSI oversold, MACD cross, you get a 466% rally over the next five years. RSI oversold, MACD cross, uh, I don't know why I didn't measure this, but this looks like a 300% uh, rally over the next two years. RSI cross, MACD oversold, or whatever. RSI oversold, MACD cross, 91% rally in a year and a half. And then we just had the MACD cross and the RSI oversold, and we started to rally, a little check back before we move higher, just like you see in all these check back before we move higher check back before move higher, uh, sometimes retest. And that's exactly what you're seeing. So this is par for the course, but when you get the check backs, the problem is, is everyone buys after the first spurt and then they buy on margin because they miss the first 30% and then it always takes them back down. And then on the second one, they don't get in and it just, it just takes off. It's, <laughs> they don't teach us in textbooks. You just have to live through it and understand human psychology. Uh, China earnings is from Brian Taikenko. The long-term earnings growth expectations for the MSCI China index uh, uh, comprised mostly of China tech companies is quite impressive. The last time it was at these levels, 2017, the index ETF rallied 55% in a year. So you can see here, and Baba did a ton more, same thing uh, in 2009. So we're, we're set up and the disbelief and the uninvestability, quote unquote, uh, are all the perfect setups for this. And the more despondent it gets, the more abrupt the rallies are and the more durable and sustainable. That's why I hope it's hated for at least 100 points or 150 points on BABA. Um, I hope everyone hates it the whole way up because uh, I don't want them to get too excited too quickly. Um, GDP tracking, we saw that this morning confirmed. Household strong, leverage ratio, total debt relative to total assets, lowest level in, in years. 20 plus, 25 years, ratio of debt payments to family income, percent of families with debt to income ratio greater than 40. All these are at multi-decade lows, not highs. So what do you see in the headlines? Credit card defaults are ticking up from aberrationally historically low, never seen before low rates. Obviously they're gonna tick up a little bit, but they're still below anything we've ever seen. Blackout periods are ending buybacks to commence. So we see the bulk of the blackout periods ending the first week of November, which also bodes well for a year-end rally and for managers to get their bonus by juicing the stock. PMI is bottoming. This is from Fundstrat. Uh, it's the time to buy industrials when that happens. That's why we have our Generac. That's why we have our Stanley Black & Decker, uh, among others that we don't talk about. And then 10-day put call moving average coming off the boil. When this thing rolls over, that's when you want to be a buyer, not a seller. Um, uh, NASDAQ 1% EMA, advanced decline ratio. Look how this thing, look how history rhymes. You get these double bottom fake outs, then you get a move up, a check back after the bottom, and then off for the big run. Double bottom, move up, check back, check back in the markets, and then a big run. And I think we're setting up for the exact same thing 
doesn't guarantee it's going to happen, but it's, it's SPX bullish percent. Same type of situation, double bottom, take them out, take the market back, and then jam it up for you know one and a half, two years. NASDAQ bullish percent, same story. You want to be a buyer, not a seller down here. I mean, consumer discretionary and staples, which we talked about, completely overdone, uh, finding the best weights in there. And um, we've talked about a number of them uh, over the recent podcast. Utilities, we talked utilities, staples, and REITs we talked about on Charles Payne last week. These are the things that are starting to work. Uh, and we've talked about our exposure now. Healthcare, same story. So I just think biotech get a little bid finally. And real estate, you can't get more oversold than this. And that's when you want to be a buyer, not a seller. So Cooper Standard reports on November 2nd. Very excited to hear that. Now on to the shorter term view for the general market. Um, uh, AAII sentiment was pessimistic again, which is good. Only 29% bullish, 43% bearish. Fear and greed was down to 30. A lot of fear in the market. And let's just see where the uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers came in because they, unfortunately, they publish it on Thursdays and I can only get the stale data in. And perfect, 24% equity exposure. The managers are completely flushed out just in time for the market to turn. I was a little nervous last week when I saw 66%. Now at 24%, I feel a lot better, uh, and you should too. Uh, earnings, uh, top 30 weights of the exploration and productive production ETF over the last 60 days. Estimates have actually gone up 4.61% and up 6.73%. So what are the top two weights? Range Resources and Southwest. We've talked about both of them. Range has been holding for many years on a 410 basis uh, over time. We blended into, we've covered that story. So um, there you go. Industrials. Cumulative earnings power is down by 1.69% for this year and down 1.28. My guess is it's probably attributable to one or two names that have an aberrationally large uh, so Boeing, Boeing screwed it up. All right, of course, par for the course. And dear, Boeing might start to get interesting again. Uh, it's pulled back a lot, uh, but I think it's Boeing and Deer that are giving this one the most trouble. Um, so that's good news. Okay, next, economic data. So this is what I was talking about this morning in terms of best of both worlds. PCE prices, Wait, no, where is it? Okay, durable goods orders came in better than expected. That's good for the economy. Continuing jobless claims were higher than expected. That's good to keep the Fed at bay. Uh, core PCE prices came in lower than expected, 2.4 versus 2.5 versus 3.7 last print. That keeps the Fed at bay. Um, durable goods orders shot the lights out month on month. Uh, also year on year relative to expectations. That's good. GDP shot the lights out. 4.9%. Uh, That's good for the economy. Um, initial jobless claims higher than expected. That's good. Keeps the Fed at bay. This is a perfect crosswinds of uh, penning home sales were actually better than expected. That's good to see. A little bit of movement uh, and so on. And tomorrow we're going to see core PCE, which is a big uh, Fed focus. So hopefully that'll also come in lower than expected and um, put the Fed to bed. All right. Ask me anything questions. If you like them, stick around. If you don't like them, thanks for tuning in. Uh, now, I, I got my schedule messed up. I thought my travel was this week. It's actually next week. I don't know whether the podcast is going to be on Tuesday, which would, is the highest probability, or it may be delayed till Saturday. I'm going to try to do it on Tuesday, but it may be as late as Saturday, but we'll get it done either way. We'll just see how much there is to talk about between now and Tuesday. If there's nothing to talk about, I'll wait till Saturday. Uh, and we'll get it out Saturday night. But, um, okay, so the first question is from Jacob about a line. Um, a line is a, they do like the dental stuffs, um, and they were, stocks down 23% today. And it slashes guidance says dental demand deteriorates. So he wants me to take a look at this. 
And the thing that was a little bit of a trigger for me is that this company is going to, I think it's gonna earn like $4 a share next year. And it's got a premium growth multiple. And what happens is when these growth stocks start decelerating, Okay, so no, they're showing ten times ten dollars. Is that right? Yeah, ten dollars a share. Okay, that's inconsistent with, um, yeah, this has a huge long-term growth rate. Um, all right. So, where did I get that number from? No. Okay. So, okay, that was last year. It did four dollars. So that was its trough earnings, and now it's rebounding. So they were going to do ten. Maybe they took guidance down today, so it'll be like nine. Um, so at $190, it's trading at 19 times, but it's got an 18% growth rate for next year and a long-term expected growth rate of 43%. Maybe they'll take that down to 20%, but the multiple's probably justified. Um, and I think what you're seeing here is, you know, it got flushed during the great financial, uh, got flushed here, got flushed during the great financial crisis, starts to work its way higher, gets shot again. Um, this one, I think you're going to have to do more of a competitive analysis. Like, who are their competitors? Why are they slowing down? Is someone taking share? Because this is like a technology that, you know, I don't really understand the competitive landscape. So you'd really have to do a strong analysis of the competitive landscape. It's not like, uh, Black & Decker or Disney or some brand where it's just the only game in town. Um, just see something here. Yeah, I don't know why this is saying $4 on ticker, but okay. Uh, the balance sheet looks like it's great. 0% <laughs> long-term debt. That's a good thing. Cash flow is good, 83. They repurchased uh, half a billion dollars of stock this year. That's good. Uh, and they still generated four, $591 million of free cash flow, double digit cash flow margins, consistent compounder. I think with this one, you just probably have to wait a few days and see how it settles out and start a starter position and, and do some research. Um, I've looked at this one a number of times. I, I could just never get comfortable with it, but I, I actually think this one will work. I just think you can probably buy it lower, you know, maybe 175, 180 if you really love it. Uh, but again, it's one you have to be careful with and really understand the business. This is not an easy one because stuff like this can go out of, uh, out of style pretty quickly. I, I mean, I know what they are. I know what they do. I just would want to understand what is their moat? Why can't like 80 other companies produce the same plastic invisible mold for, you know, it's like, is there one company that sells all the braces? No, there's tons of them. So uh, Jim L, thanks for the valuable content you provide. My question is about Cooper Standards uh, cash position as it relates to the current UAW strike. If Fain drags out the strike longer term, Plan to share at what point do you start to get concerned about Cooper's liquidity and just change your thesis on the position? Thanks, Jim. Um, good question. Knock on wood, no longer relevant. But uh, this is something I was watching every day. That's why I'm up Friday night at four o'clock listening to this idiot on his Facebook Live uh, talking about uh, the dividends that should be his versus the owner's and just trying not to laugh. But um, Leaving that aside, I could see that the membership, the natives were getting restless and a re reasonable deal was on the table. Uh, and Sean, Sean had to push for a couple more points because he wants to then parlay that into trying to get Tesla unionized and Toyota unionized. And good luck with that because Musk will handle it the way that it should have been handled the minute they threaten to go on strike to shut down the whole factory and drain the UAW fund until they come up with a reasonable expectation. 
I'm not saying they shouldn't have gotten 23% or 25% or whatever they got. I think they just, they needed a raise. They, they, they were behind for a long time. Uh, they needed to catch up to inflation, maybe a little bit more, but it does make Ford and GM and uh, Stellantis less competitive moving forward and they will have to raise prices. So we'll see how that affects competition. Um, um, but the point is that it was simple math. I knew that the UAW would run out of their $800 million faster than the OEMs would run out of their 5 billion, uh, or they had five months, the OEMs had five months of cash. He had about five weeks of cash. So if it was Mexican standoff, he would lose. And he knew that. And that's why he started panicking after the Friday call and after the uh, GM call when Mary Barr is like, we're just not doing it. Um, that's why he just started closing all these factors because time was running out and the natives were getting restless and he had to, he had to go all in. He could no longer stagger it because time was working against him. And sure enough, everyone blinked and no one got a good deal, but everyone will parade it around as if they all got a great deal. Um, it is what it is. It, I think, I think it's a good sign that no one's got a super big smile on their face. JP Ding, first off, love the podcast. The price action of 3M has been awful. This is more of a small cap macro sell-off versus a company-specific thing. It's not a small cap stock. Uh, curious if any of your thinking has changed. I went through all the IR materials and everything's really healthy, normalized earnings and site, but maybe I'm missing something, etc. Uh, so this was sent to me the day before they reported earnings and the stock was up 12%. That's what you see when people are getting flushed. Tila Tap, Tom, do you have any BABA derivative exposure? Uh, do you hedge any positions at all? Buying a small amount of puts on BABA would have worked well. So this is hindsight bias, Tila Tap. It's like, yeah, sure, you can buy puts. When you're buying the stock at lows, you're buying puts when they're the absolute most expensive. And then the question is, do you buy it for a month? Do you buy it for three months? Do you buy it for six months? When they expire and the stock is still at lows, do you buy more? And the answer to the question is, you need to know what you're owning and buy a piece of the business. If you're hedging it, it means you haven't done your work and you don't know what you own. You know, if you bought an apartment building that was generating or, you know, package of 20,000 apartment buildings that were generating uh, $25 billion of free cash flow and growing, would you hedge those cash flows? Would you hedge those apartment buildings? And the answer is no, if you bought them right at a huge discount to liquidation value. If, they, if the current market value of those buildings was $100 billion and you bought them at 50 billion or 30 billion, um, what's there to hedge? It, all the hedge would do, if you'd bought puts and stock at $80, probably, the put the at the money puts would have been at that point 30 35 dollars just for a few months so you basically would have brought your basis over the last year from 80 dollars to probably 180 dollars just by quote unquote hedging so um that is um the absolute opposite of what you want to do you want to be selling premium at the lows for stocks that you want to buy and and uh, basically, you know, buying premium, uh, depending on the implied volatility, there's complexity to it. But the answer to your question is low leverage, low leverage, buy companies you own and wait, be in the time arbitrage business. If you can't handle short term volatility, then just buy apartment buildings where you can't get, you know, headlined out of your position. I mean, that's really all it comes down to. If you don't have the stomach, Look, the reason I do this business versus private deals is very simple. I can buy the highest quality assets in the world from time to time, not all the time, from time to time at prices that would never be entertained in the real world. They would, If I walked into the boardroom and offered them the prices that they were being offered in the public market, they would, they would have me carried out by security. If I... Um, if I offered that for a comparable business in the private market, they wouldn't even take my meeting. And yet every month there are some business, some sector, some quality durable business that due to short term temporary impairments, headline risk, market risk, sector risk are oversold structurally because of the structure of Wall Street 
and the need for short-term performance by people that have the wrong partners uh, that uh, will never outperform over time because they have to smooth volatility in the short term and blow all the returns through buying puts at the exact wrong time to buy puts in the hole. So um, what was the question? Oh, well, there you go. I hope that answers your question. Martin Crumlish, uh, saw your tweet on the Bank of Japan doing an unannounced round of bond purchases. You hinted at uh, Japan's central bank impacting the dollar in previous podcasts. I'm wondering if it's related. Yes, it is. If you haven't touched upon it this week, could you add some context? We did earlier uh, in the call. Thanks for what you do. I share the podcast with everyone uh, who I know who likes investing. Thank you, Martin. Great question. Glad you picked up on that. It's already happening. They are intervening. They're starting with the bond purchases. I think we're going to see some more defense of the yen. That's good for weakening the dollar and everything else. And we're seeing it start to be reflected in bond yields, which is also a good thing. Um, and thank you for sharing it. That's very important. Keep this thing going. The more people you share it with, the longer we're going to do it in perpetuity for non-clients. Clients will always get it. And uh, last thing is uh, opinion, not advice. Go to hedgefundtips.com and click on terms. Simon Lee. Hey, Tom, love listening to your podcast channel. I appreciate it if you could give your opinion on whether or not you think Albemarle would be a solid pick. Also, they generate about 80% of revenues from abroad, which ties into your thesis for the decline of dollar and its effects on the revenue of multinationals. Good pick up on that, Simon. Let's take a look. I feel like we might have done this one a little while ago. Um, all right, let's see. A, L, B. All right, if I recall, I think this is basically a play on EVs. If I'm not mistaken, let me just see here. Um, uh, lithium, okay, boomer. So this is trading like a... Um, EV play because of the lithium play. And uh, I, I I don't want anything to do with that trade. I own Cooper Standard on the basis of ICEs. That was my original thesis. If the demand, if the governments force demand for a non-economic product, which they're fully capable of doing, uh, then we'll benefit it by getting higher margins. If they don't, if they're unable to, because they'll put all these businesses out of business, then uh, we'll still benefit from the ICEs. So, Leaving that aside, um, see some nice acceleration here. I don't like commodity plays in general, um, but let's just take a look. Balance sheet looks probably good. Let's see. Three billion, it got one and a half billion in cash, it's fine. Generating cash from operations looks good. 2.6. CapEx is pretty heavy. And it generated about a billion. So everything looks good except, and now they're excelling. Yeah, I mean, I understand why you like this. I hate commodity plays because um I think there there will be a time to buy this, but um, I think it's going to be at a lot lower prices. That's just my opinion. I can be completely wrong with this and be completely, as, as I always say, I'm fine with errors of omission. I'm not okay with errors of commission. With this, I think I'd just be, yes, it looks like it's cheap because it's down almost two thirds. I think this thing, um, let me just see something here. So they must have done a huge acquisition here. Let me just see something here. So lithium is 53 and 65. After you heard what Musk was saying on his conference call, I don't know about the demand for EVs. I think you're gonna see hybrids go through the roof. Um, and the big three, and then the big three are gonna start putting out more affordable cars with the hybrids uh, that can get you know 50 or 100 miles a gallon, and they're gonna be off to the races. Uh, let's see. I think it's going to be hybrids and Tesla. I, I, I just don't, I, 
since day one, I've never been certain that people want EVs. I think they want Teslas or they want, honestly, they want Teslas or they want Escalades and Suburbans and uh, Tahoes. I mean, that's really all it comes down to. Um, I, I can't get there on Albemarle. I, you know what? If it drops below 100, send in the question again and we'll revisit it. But at these levels, um, it doesn't mean it's not going to work. Just do more work on it. I, I wouldn't buy it here. Um, what do you think of the motivation is behind Buffett and Berkshire not buying Alibaba? Um, I, you know, it's a good question. Look, I think it's political. I don't think he wants anything Chinese at the moment. The guy's, you know, 93, 94. Um, he, he doesn't need to make any, he's got, look, he's got more than enough China exposure with Apple. I mean, which is such a huge portion of the portfolio. If anything goes wrong in China, he's toast. Uh, uh, Berkshire would be toast. So, uh, and with the S and P and with a lot of things. So, uh, I don't think he needs to double that exposure. And they also have BYD, which, which, you know, did nothing for 10 years and then was like a eight bagger in one year. So the IRR was still pretty good on that. And that's why they're the richest guy, you know, best investors in the world is because they can sit through the short term volatility. And eventually, sooner or later, the voting machine is outweighed by the weighing machine and the price catches up to the fundamental value. And that's been and for, for us, sometimes it happens in six to 12 months. Sometimes it takes three years. And in some cases, it takes longer. But if you do your work right and you buy it right and you're patient and you're on low leverage, you're going to get the return. Uh, it's it's inevitable. So. Um, so that's that. Uh, next is Lucas Schmid. Hard to decide where to pull the trigger with everything tumbling 50% in the blink of an eye. Okay, I don't know what stocks you're in, but um, currently looking through Europe and Aiden and Alfin came up. I guess Aiden, you know, since it's a similar story to PayPal, profitable and growing fast with lots of fear about too much competition in the space. Not sure if that one is already cheap enough though. What do you think about Alfin? which seems to be a few profitable EV charging and other energy solutions business out there. I don't, I don't, I'm not playing the EV charging. I don't know which one's going to win. I mean, in the U S they were all losers. So, uh, I'm, I'm a pass on that. Um, Aiden, I, I like PayPal better. So, uh, I appreciate the questions by the way, Lucas, I'm not trying to, um, I've looked at, I, I want to own PayPal, period. I understand it. I like it. I know where it's going. I know what it's trading at. Aiden, I, I don't want to mess around with that. I, and, and I just won't do chargers. I don't care if it's a perfect looking business. It's a new technology. You're guessing on the future. And I don't want to play that game. That's not what, what we do. And you can get rich guessing on the future if you get it right. But for me, nine, nine, 999 out of 1,000, you're wrong. One out of a thousand, you get the next Tesla and you get rich overnight. And no one writes books about the 999 people that got smoked on the next big idea. Tony Dyson, uh, thanks for the podcast. Great value. Having followed the stock market the last few years, I'm wondering if there even is a case for the buy and hold long term strategy. It seems uh, it's all short term gambling these days. How else can you explain these price swings? Fundamentals don't seem to matter at all. How can I sleep? calm buying what i believe is a good company in the long run if there's an armada of gamblers potentially shorting it to the ground on the slightest whiff of bad news i just feel like i waste a lot of time doing research on the fundamentals which don't seem to matter i mean how can you justify so many stock prices below COVID lows while COVID was a real threat of a real global shutdown of the economy yes today there are many issues but co common wtf Maybe my feelings signal a bottom, smiley face. Regards, Tony. Tony, I think you answered your own question. And the fact that you can acknowledge that you're caught in the midst of an emotional breakdown because prices aren't cooperating in the short term um, tells me you are making an enormous progress. So if you keep doing the work on cash flow generative, proven businesses with durable advantages that have stood the test of time, and don't try to guess what the next great technology is because odds are against you. Uh, don't worry about the short-term price movements. Buy it with a margin of safety. Hold it. Don't even look at the day-to-day -day if you can, can do that. Low to no leverage, and you're going to do great over time. Good stuff. Ivor Barry, if you had $5,000 to allocate into one of your positions today, what would it be and why? 
I would never allocate all of my capital into one position ever because there's always the possibility of something that you don't know that you don't know. Uh, and, um, and that's how people get wiped out. So um, I would avoid that, uh, but I would consider as concentrated a portfolio as three to five uh, names at any one time. And um, my clients understand by the weightings in their portfolio, which those three names would be. So leaving it at that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next week, probably a different time, probably a different place, but we'll get it out there. And thanks for tuning in. Uh, in the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.